Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 8, Potential Energy and Conservation of Energy. This is the second chapter we are covering this week as we cover work, energy, and conservation of energy. So uh, section 8.1 starts out with the potential energy of a system and in the chapter 7 we talked about kinetic energy and work kinetic energy theorem and potential energy is really the, the third and the last uh, important piece here. It's, uh, whenever we talk about energy, we will be talking about kinetic energy and potential energy together is what we call mechanical energy. And um, whenever we talk about energy conservation, we really mean uh, conservation of mechanical energy and potential energy is the second component of mechanical energy. So this section 8.1, it's a, um, it looks kind of like a section that could have been in an algebra-based physics class or even conceptual physics class. It covers the potential energy basics. Um, um, and it, uh, I guess in some sense, it, your textbook goes in a slightly different order than I would have covered it. Um, I would have covered the distinction of conservative and non-conservative forces first, and that would have led into the introduction of potential energy, and that is what you will see in the lectures. Um, so your textbook starts out with uh, section 8.1, which is fine. <laughs> and uh, I guess uh, doing it that way misses out some of the explanations of natural explanations that would have been naturally coming in <laughs> when you do it in the right order. So here it talks about how a uh, change in the potential energy is the minus of the work done by, in this case, gravitational force. And uh, this uh, would have been uh, very naturally explained if you talk about uh, conserv the properties of conservative force and how work done by conservative force uh, leads to the en energy being stored, or more precisely, negative work done. So if uh, conservative force does negative work, then that leads to, with this minus sign, that leads to a positive change of potential energy. So that negative work done by conservative force leads to a positive change of potential energy. And uh, so here you can just look at this as an equation that you see and um, <laughs> understand partially. And uh, when you get to section 8.2, maybe it'll make a slightly more sense. <laughs> But still, we are talking about potential energy of a system, and in situations where um, energy is conserved, you will see that the change of kinetic energy is um, matched by change of potential energy. Um, the sign makes it so that when they are on the same side, the change of kinetic energy plus the change of potential energy will add up to zero in situations where mechanical energy is conserved. And uh, this section has some examples. Take a look. They are probably useful. And uh, they, they talk about types of potential energy. And this is where you will see a few formulas that you should uh, memorize. Again, I, I told you that I don't ask you to memorize too many formulas. I've asked you to memorize uh, formula for centripetal acceleration, formula for the kinetic energy. And now I'm asking you to memorize a formula for the potential energies. So you have two uh, formulas for potential energy here. One is the gravitational potential energy. And this is what we'll be using until we get to the Newton's law of universal gravitation in chapter 13. Until then, gravitational force is kind of simple, you know, mg. So you have relatively simple form for the gravitational potential energy. So you should have that memorized. And as a second example of potential energy, your textbook covers elastic potential energy or spring potential energy. And the form of this spring potential energy is something that you should have memorized as well. Spring potential energy is equal to one half spring constant times displacement squared. And um, I don't think your textbook goes through the full derivation of this. Let me check in the next section. 
Um, I do derive this in the lecture, and this is one prime example of how a work done by a non-constant force, that is the conservative, leads to change of potential energy. Oh, and I just remembered, your textbook does cover it. Your textbook covered the derivation of this, actually back in the uh, section 7. Point, oh, I'm pretty sure that was <laughs> equation 7.5. So your textbook does cover it, but yeah, it, it did it out of order. Uh, I think this derivation would have fit a lot better in this section we are at. But your textbook does cover it, and I also do it in lecture, in the correct place in the lecture. <laughs> um, so that's the second example of potential energy, and, uh, and that's it. We have no other form of potential energy in this class. And now we'll have a, a different form of uh, expression for gravitational potential energy when you are dealing with the Newton's law of universal gravitation, and when something might be really far from Earth's surface, not just the near Earth's surface. But it's still the same type of potential energy, gravitational potential energy. And that really comes from the fact that we have two conservative forces in this class, gravity and spring force. All the other forces you see in the, this class, even though some of them, it's natural to think of them as being conservative, turns out they are not. And in the lecture, um, you will see me explain. So uh, in this section 8.1, let's see, your textbook does cover this example of um, handling gravitational and spring potential energy together. Um, I don't think it points out some special features that I would have liked to have seen it pointed out. The lecture does it. Watch the lecture. <laughs> That's fine. Um, it's it's a, some problem-solving simplification, so I, I think it's fine that your textbook doesn't cover it. And then it has some examples of, you know, what's a large amount of energy, what's a small amount of energy. And I'll, I'll be honest, um, I don't have a good sense when, when something's a large amount versus small amount, because a lot of it is so context-dependent. So... I don't know how useful all this is. So, uh, I, I myself don't have uh, m many of these scales memorized. Uh, I don't know if it's ever useful. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, let's go to the next section, section 8.2. Um, and I will just lead by saying I uh, strongly disagree <laughs> with your, how your textbook covers conservative force. Um, there are some aspects of what they cover is common, um, common, common enough uh, in other textbooks. So your textbook says the work done by a conservative force independent of path. Yes, that's true. And in fact, I guess uh, uh, that's a fact that you would end up relying on here and there. So that coverage is great. And uh, and uh, different places you will see us using um, that factor to, you know, kind of work out change in the gravitational potential energy, either by um, uh, mass being pushed up and inclined or by mass being directly pushed up and then horizontally, the change of potential energy is the same. Change of gravitational potential energy is the same because gravity is a conservative force and the change of gravitational potential energy is tied to the work done by gravitational force. Um, the part that I think it's almost better for you to ignore is how your textbook goes into this whole calculus stuff about um, exact differential and all this stuff. I, I think it's uh, not you have many of you haven't taken multivariable calculus yet and all the language of all this stuff um, so I mean you know as with everything you know read everything skim everything and if somehow this doesn't make sense and it confuses you then skip it because <laughs> I really think your textbook shouldn't have brought this in at this point. I, uh, Because of how strongly I disagree, I looked at a couple other textbooks that I used to use in the past, and yeah, none of them bring in this uh, multivariable calculus language. So take a look at it, and if you have taken Math 3C, and if somehow all of this makes sense to you, then great. Otherwise, you know, if you just ignored... Uh, like somewhere from here uh, all the way to like this example even, you would have lost nothing. And uh, some of what your textbook calls conservative, and I think that's uh, something that authors here do, is what might be called um, 
conservative vector field and it's a mathematical thing and you might see them mentioned in uh, math 3c and the sense in which a vector field is conservative and some sense in which um, energy conservation happens sometimes there's a bit of a um, uh, misalignment there so like the degree to which your textbook authors rely on basically conservative vector field, I don't think it's all that helpful. So, skim it, uh, and if it makes sense to you, then great. If it doesn't, skip it, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, now this part, don't skip it. Uh, so, in fact, this is kind of where a lot of that comes from. Um, so, whenever you have a conservative force, you should be able to associate it with uh, potential energy. And it, that, um, that association is so complete, you can go either way. You can either get the potential energy through the work done by conservative force or the other way. If you already have a form of potential energy, you can derive conservative force from that by taking derivative or in the multivariable vector calculus by taking the gradient of the uh, potential. So, so yeah, starting with around here, don't skip it to <laughs> read through it because that is something that's useful, um, uh, helpful for you to know. So I think that's uh, it for this section. And in section 8.3, conservation of energy, it um, it uh, works through some of the problem-solving strategies using conservation of mechanical energy. Now, I do mention this in lecture. Whenever we say conservation of energy, we really mean conservation of mechanical energy because energy, including all its forms that will be mentioned in section 8.5, it's always conserved. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's only when we limit ourselves to mechanical energy, kinetic and potential energy, there's a possibility of energy not being conserved. So, um, and, and that's really also where non-conservative force means. A non-conservative force doesn't conserve mechanical energy because the work done doesn't go into a potential energy. So, um, so in this section, you will see a problem-solving strategy, I think, some statement about conservation of mechanical energy. And yeah, here's the problem-solving strategy. It's good to read it through. I have my own version that I teach uh, when I do the lecture. And you know, they'll, the steps won't align completely. And you know, I actually recommend that you, you come up with the steps that fit you. So when we were covering standard strategy, we had a rather rigid four-step strategy, you know. Draw a free body diagram, define axis, break forces in the components, <laughs> and write down Newton's second uh, law equation, and it was quite rigid. And what I would tell you is that um, I think you gain more from coming up with your own problem-solving strategy. And what we have in the textbook is one guide. You might use that. What you see me, uh, what you see me outline in the lecture. That's another example of set of steps. Well, I go through. And uh, you might come up with your own set of steps that kind of covers more or less the same things. And the main thing is that many of the physics problems involve multi-step problem-solving strategy. It's not going to be a right formula, plug in the numbers, get the answer. Easy questions will be like that, but anything but the easiest questions will require you to go through steps like this, uh, kind of a, a systematic way to um, approach it. Uh, uh, step by step. I'm saying step too many times, but yeah. So, um, so it, this section has a bunch of examples of problem solving using conservation of mechanical energy. Take a read through. They're helpful, useful, um, and uh, this. Yeah. So usually, uh, if we need the time information, we won't use conservation of energy because uh, then you have to do this kind of stuff. But you know, there's actually a uh, yeah in. Um, in uh, upper division stuff, you will see approaches that look like this. So it's an, it's useful to look, um, kind of to be aware that, oh yeah, there's an approach like this to the problem solving. But uh, in this lower division, like if you have to do this, there's probably a better way to approach the particular problem. Uh, so yeah, 
And uh, the next two sections, we don't really cover it in the lecture, but I do recommend that you read through the text of uh, section 8.4, uh, the potential energy diagram. Uh, you will see this used more, I think, later on in the semester. A diagram like this um, illustrating simple harmonic oscillator motion is really useful. And, um, and yeah, so you will see me come back to this in lecture at some point. Um, and it's a um, uh, good for you to skim it now. And so you have some level of familiarity. And it also talks about some of the stuff that I won't cover in lecture, but hey, uh, it's good for you to see. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, the sinusoidal oscillation, which we'll come back to way back later when we do uh, oscillations. <laughs> Um, and finally, section 8.5, you know, uh, in a conceptual physics class, uh, when we talk about energy, it would be basically section 8.1, maybe a tiny fraction of 8.2, and then 8.5. This is the kind of stuff that's uh, important when people are thinking about energy. This kind of stuff affects, you know, uh, public policy. Um, uh, having said all that, it doesn't really affect uh, physics problem solving, so... I do recommend that you read it through, like with everything, you know, read everything, don't skip them without having at least skimmed it. Um, having said that, um, we don't really have any problem questions about renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. So, but, you know, do read it through it. This is the kind of things that we would cover in a conceptual physics class. And um, in this calculus space, the general physics, um, you know, this might be your first physics class. You might not have taken a high school or a conceptual physics class. Then um, th the sections like this are really the sections where you are learning everything that you would have, should have learned in an earlier class that you might have taken or might not have taken. So, so yeah, I think that's the last section. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the second chapter we covered this week. And next week, uh, we will cover the second conserved quantity that uh, we use in problem solving uh, in chapter nine. So until then, bye.